In John chapter 2, Jesus did something many people hoped the Messiah would do, cleanse the temple. They believed the temple priests were corrupt, they collaborated with Rome, and they charged high prices to pilgrims who came there to worship. In fact, a group called the Essenes trained as priests so they could replace the current crop when they believed the Christ would appear. King Herod began the restoration of the temple compound before he passed away in 4 BC. The work lasted long after his death, until 62 AD. Actually, it only took 18 months to rebuild the temple, but 46 years to expand the grounds where the building stood. This is the place we call the Temple Mount, literally the middle of the city. This area would grow into the legal, cultural, and commercial center of the region and rival any city in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So naturally, the Temple Mount would also include a marketplace. The temple leadership took advantage of this arrangement. They leased spaces in front of the holy place to money changers and merchants. These businessmen facilitated the exchange of foreign coins for Hebrew shekels and the sale of animals for sacrifice to out-of-town pilgrims. The space at the entrance of the temple was a tourist trap with its exorbitant prices. In the vernacular, we would call this a racket. But there was more. The place where the merchants occupied was known as the Court of the Gentiles, a place where non-Jews could come and worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had to worship outside the temple itself, since they were barred from entering under the penalty of death. However, with the space occupied with hucksters, loud bartering, and noisy animals, how could anyone, Jew or Gentile, were truly worship God? Jesus entered the scene and chased away the businessman, he upset blasphemous commerce and set himself face to face with the temple priests. What gives you the right? They demanded of him. What sign will you give us to justify your actions? Jesus replied in an enigmatic way. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. As John the evangelist stated, he referred to his own body. This answer foreshadowed his death and resurrection. It also hinted at the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. Both the body of the Lord and the holy site would suffer ruin, but unlike the temple, he would rise into eternal life. After his resurrection, the disciples would reflect on his actions at the temple. His words and deeds added more reasons to believe in him, not only as the Messiah, but as the Savior of all, Jew and Gentile alike. John ended the scene with a comment on the excitement Jesus caused. Many followed him just because of acts like cleansing the temple. But their enthusiasm would be short-lived. He knew most disciples were of the fair-weather type. Here today, gone tomorrow. He understood the hearts of people, especially those who painted him with their shallow expectations and did not grasp the importance of his prediction. He came not to merely cleanse the temple of riffraff. No, he came to conquer death 
and open the door to eternal life. At the cleansing of the temple, Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. In retrospect, we can justify our title for him as Lord based upon his actions. He taught those thirsty to hear the word of God. He healed those in need. He suffered, died, and returned, not just to life, but to eternal life. The term Lord not only became a title of respect, but a realization of his divinity. Like Thomas, we too fall down in adoration before the presence of Christ and declare, My Lord and my God.